Hey everyone, welcome back for a new exclusive Collider interview. I am beyond thrilled to have Matthew Heineman, the director of A Private War, on the set right now. First off, welcome. Thanks for having me. Before I even ask you about your movie, I just have to say, this is something else, and it it's kind of eating away at me. I was just talking about it with uh, some other Collider employees before, that it doesn't feel like it's getting a far enough reach yet. I want to get people talking about this, and especially Rosamund Pike's performance in this. Like, how, how is that not getting more recognition right now? It's very frustrating to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Uh, so clearly, uh, we're going to celebrate that and hopefully spread the word out there. But yeah. first thing I want to ask you, because you're obviously a very uh, acclaimed documentary director, is what came first, this story and this script, or the idea to make your first narrative feature? You know, I think a lot of documentary filmmakers do so as a sort of a gateway drug to make narratives. Um, not a lot, but, but some do. And, and for me, you know, I, I know sort of master plan of making narratives. Um, I've, I love making docs. I'll continue to make docs. Uh, I made a film called Cartel Land, and um, afterwards, I guess some people thought I should be making narratives, and so I got sent a bunch of scripts, none of which I wanted to make. Um, and then I received an early draft of this script, and it just spoke to me in such a profound way um, that I felt like I, I had to tell a story. Well, it sounds like a very similar situation people could be in, even when they make a first feature that is a narrative that takes off, and all of a sudden you're getting every opportunity in the world because you made one good film. It sounds like it's a, it could be a very similar path there. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I wouldn't have made any uh, any narrative film. I mean, this, again, this this film was was deeply personal to me. Mm -hmm. um, it was about a, a world that I've lived in. It's about a world that I know. Uh, you know, my mom was a journalist, um, and you know, it's a world I grew up in. And so it just, yeah, it just felt like I uh, something that spoke to me in such a strong way, and and also was incredibly timely. You know, in this world where journalism is under attack, and and um, media is under attack, you know, I think it's so important to celebrate people like Marie who are out there fighting for the truth and, you know, shedding light on dark corners of the world. It's really refreshing getting a story in that respect, but also because nowadays we're constantly on social media and it feels like the kind of news I ingest more often. And before I even shifted to film, I was a journalism major and I had a great appreciation for long form storytelling and immersive storytelling. So it's especially refreshing getting that experience through her eyes in this movie versus let's say, you know, a Twitter news brief that's X amount of characters. Yeah, I mean, I think she believed, like I believe, um, you know, that it's it, it's so easy for people to keep these conflicts at, at arm's length. It's so easy to not engage, it's so easy to sort of, you know, read a stat or look at a photo or look at a headline and feel like you understand an issue. And, you know, I've tried as much as possible in my documentaries to take these issues that are so complex and, you know, and, and try to humanize them in, in an effort to just create a little bit of empathy to get people to care. And that's what she did for two plus decades mm -hmm. in some of those dangerous places on earth. Well, I also can't speak for everybody, but it also seems like, you know, documentary filmmaking and this kind of reporting that forces you to not only just respond to it immediately, but take it with you versus let's say just clicking a like button or sharing and then moving on with your life. Take it with you. Like, take it with you, like personally, like really, just have a, a much fuller understanding and have it on your mind. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's that's what she tried to do, and I mm -hmm. guess in some sort of meta sense, you know, we're trying to do with this film is get people to care about the issues that that she uh, covered, and you know, obviously, tragically, where the film ends in Syria, um, you know, that that's that's an issue that. Um, had, you know, she, she, she was killed in 2012, um, and, you know, unfortunately and sadly and tragically, that issue has persisted um, until t this day. You know, 500,000 plus civilians have been killed since she was killed. Um, and I think if she were alive today, she'd probably be in Idlib or, or somewhere else mm -hmm. um, still telling that story. Absolutely. Um, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the framing device of the story, too. The idea of having the title card that says X amount of years until Holmes, was that something that was in the script right from when you got it, or is that something that came up naturally as you went along, or maybe even in the edit room? Um, it's something something that, you know, when I came on board, 
you know, I, I was really moved by the script, but I, I, I spent about a year researching, like I'd research a doc, um, gaining the trust of her friends and her colleagues with Rosamond, um, you know, reading everything I could about her, reading everything that I could, um, uh, that she wrote, working with Marie Brenner, uh, the Vanity Fair uh, journalist who, who wrote the original article on which this, this, this script is based. Um, and then using all that research to to dig in with a Rashomel, our screenwriter, mm -hmm. you know, to to really restructure the film uh, and and take it away from sort of a, a biopic and make it much more, in my mind, a psychological thriller of of trying to understand what drives somebody to go to these places, what drives somebody to do this, but also the effect that this had on her psychologically, um, uh, and you know, obviously from the PTSD that she she suffered from. Can you tell me about approaching this as one, a, a truthful telling of her story, but also understanding the requirement that you are adapting a story to to film, and that's a different medium, and you need to have, you know, I, I guess I have to say, entertainment value to it a little bit. So where were you able to find that balance? Was it difficult to kind of pinpoint where that should be? Um, I, I don't know if it was difficult. I mean, there, there's so much inherent drama in her mm -hmm. story and, and what she went through and what she covered. Um, I think, you know, I think the, the hardest part was, 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 was structuring it. Um, because inherently, by being a war correspondent, you're at war and you're at home. And you're at war and you're home and you're at war and you're home. And, you know, we weren't covering one specific story. And so, again, for me, that's why getting inside of her head and trying to understand how these... Uh, war zones were progressively affecting her over time, and that you know, as she, as the film crescendos towards the end, mm -hmm. you know she's she's suffering more and more from alcoholism and PTSD, and 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 pushing that limit, you know, more and more despite every single neon sign blaring stop, stop, stop. She kept going. It's really incredible, and also the amount of access you you give us to everything that's going on in her head, especially between you and Rosman's performance. I was wondering when you first signed on, was she just at the top of your list from the beginning, or did you ever have to envision another actor in that role? Um, she was always at the top of my list. She came to a screening in my last documentary, City of Ghosts, um, and we, we got along quite well. We had breakfast the next morning. Um, and she sort of came after the role as if, you know, it was Marie going after an article. She had such passion for, for this film and the story and for, for Marie, but also such an um, incredible understanding of who she was. We both wrote each other essays of who is Marie Colvin um, after this breakfast. And it was amazing how similar they both were. And it, it just was so clear after reading it that this was my Marie. And we said about... Um, yeah, going on this really intense journey and, and gaining the trust of her friends and her colleagues and mm -hmm. and, and preparing for this role. Um, and, you know, she did an incredible, incredible job. I really wanted somebody who was going to get their hands dirty, who was going to get in the trenches with me, and she did that in, in spades. She really just, I mean, a physical transformation and her voice, it's, it's really astounding how she completely loses herself in this part. Yeah, I mean, you know, she worked for months and months and months with a dialect coach. You know, it's not an easy accent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she's obviously from, from a, she's a British actress from from um, London, and and you know, Marie is is from Long Island and had this sort of whiskey tone and 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 uh, this you know lower octave. And um, but she also transformed physically. You know, she studied Marie, how she moved, how she held tension in her neck and her back, and how she. You know, splayed her hands when she gesticulated, and um, she she studied Marie, uh, Marie with a with a dancer, and hmm. uh, with this dancer, sort of again tried to learn how she moved, and um, spent many many weeks doing that. She she had a tutor to try to understand, you know, the geopolitical context that we were you know venturing into, and so she really, you know, did an incredible job preparing. One of the interesting things that I read in the press notes that I really wanted to ask you about was uh, Jamie Dornan Sorry. plays Paul, and Paul was on set at the beginning, I believe, if I read this correctly, and he actually gave Jamie notes at the beginning of the shoot. So a as a director, how did that make you feel? Were you Did you kind of usher him in to be able to do that, or are you like, you, know, you can hold back a little, I'm the director here? Oh uh, yeah, my uh, my ego is yeah. Is I no, I'm happily have somebody who was there, for real, giving Jamie notes. Um, Paul was 
like many people, apprehensive about the film. Um, I think you, you know, her death is so raw for so many people still, mm -hmm. you know, this many years later. Uh, so getting him on board was was really important. Um, and, you know, he was incredibly helpful with, with the final drafts of the script. Um, and, you know, he was originally supposed to come on for, you know, a week, five days uh, at the beginning of shooting, and he ended up staying for every single day for the entire shoot. You know, and, and some actors obviously would be reticent about the character that they're portraying being there. Um, he and Jamie uh, got along so well. Um, he was an inspiration not just to Jamie, but to me and to Rosman, to really every single person on the set um, as a living, breathing example of why we were telling this story. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I read in the notes we were talking about earlier, and I really want you to speak to as much as you possibly can, is the idea of bringing in a certain group of extras here. Also because whether it's this movie or any movie, I feel like background performances also always go very undervalued when that can take someone out of a movie in a heartbeat. But here in particular, I mean, really every single scene you have in this movie, everybody around your main characters is having a really powerful emotional experience. So casting those individuals seems like it is of the utmost importance here. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a control freak and I, you know, <laughs> Every single detail, every single frame, every single pixel on screen, you know, mattered to me. Um, and we spent so much time with every single department preparing uh, to shoot the film. Um, and authenticity, both in her experience and her portrayal of Marie, but also the, the experience of being at war and being in these war zones was really important to me. And a huge part of bringing that alive was casting non-actors, refugees living in Jordan where we shot. So that you know, when we're in Iraq, uh, when she's uncovering a mass grave, you know the women who are wailing are real Iraqi women who are reliving real trauma. When we're in um, homes, you know the besieged city of homes in Syria, uh, on her final assignment, when she walks into this you know uh, shelter for for women and children, the two women that she spoke to were really from homes. They really were in a shelter that was quite similar to that one, and they were telling their own real stories and shedding real tears. And so when the second woman says, I don't just want this to be words on paper, I want the whole world to understand what I'm going through, mm -hmm. she's obviously speaking to Raz, but she's speaking to all of us. And you know, there's a scene afterwards in which a, a, a man brings in you know, his, his young son who ends up dying in, in this hospital, it's an incredibly emotional scene. I spent weeks and weeks finding that man and interviewing people for that role. Um, you know, he was also from Holmes. Um, he had a two-year-old nephew that was shot off his shoulders by a sniper and, and, and died in front of him. So the trauma that he, and the emotion that he brought into that room was, you know, almost unbearable. And there was a point at which Roz had to sort of walk off set and, you know, she, she, and she and I went out and talked to her and she said, you know, is this okay? You know, we're, we're blurring these lines so much. I don't know, is this right? You know, are we exploiting this man? And, and I said to her, look, this is what I do on a daily basis in my documentaries. You know, there's, you have this human instinct to want to give someone a hug or to give them space. Um, but, you know, my job and our job is to, is to capture these moments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he wouldn't be here if he didn't want his story to be told. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I can definitely understand that. Um, given everything you just said, I mean, between this movie and also your documentaries, you tackle a lot of very tough subject matter. So I imagine you can't really kind of get your head above it and take a breath of, of air while you're making a movie. But do you have a way to kind of relax and, and detox and not not kind of wallow in all of this in your free time? Um, yeah, I mean, I've <laughs> I've friends and loved ones and I love to surf. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of things I, I like to do. Um, but I, you know, I also care deeply about mm -hmm. The, f the films I make and, and the stories that I tell, and I think it's a huge privilege and a huge honor to be able to do so, and also to be able to jump into a world every couple of years and, and explore that world. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a privilege. Well, I greatly appreciate that passion and drive, and I'm very thankful we have a movie like this. I meant what I said earlier, guys. Go check out A Private War. You won't regret it. Matthew, a huge congratulations again, and a thank you for coming into the studio today. Good luck with uh, everything here on out. Thank Guys, you. thank you for watching this interview. As always, like and share it and stay tuned for more Collider interviews.